Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 1 and verse 12. I'm going to read you that verse as we look this morning. As we ponder this morning, as we ask ourselves the question, are we winning the crown of life? Or more specifically, are you in the direction of life that it takes from God's perspective to win the crown of life? It's a very sobering question I think we should ask ourselves when so many around us say that they are Christians. But God says those who are my people look like this. And let's look at what he says in James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The Lord Jesus Christ promised that there is something at the end of the line for those who finish life loving him. Let me underscore that. We're going to see, but I want to tell you up front, that there's something in the scriptures that it's not as important how you start as how you finish. Many started with Christ, few finished. Many followed Christ, few finished. Many heard the message, few heard with their hearts and continued to the end. One thing that is for sure that the scriptures say is no genuine believer in Jesus Christ ever stops believing. Oh, sometimes they struggle, sometimes they are fiercely tempted, sometimes they doubt. They never stop believing. The whole book of 1 John gives tests of life eternal. One of them is a true believer never stops believing. The Lord Jesus Christ said, no one that comes to me. Will I ever turn away? And all who come to me, I will keep to the end. And he says, I will hold them in my hand. But some people turn away and don't follow him anymore. And for those who love him to the end, for those who follow him to the end, for those who are his very own to the end, he promises a wonderful reward. It's called the crown of life. And the crown of life begins... What the scriptures give us in the book of James, the second major section of this book. We've seen that there are 12 pieces James sews together on the inspiration of God's spirit, which actually are tests of maturing faith. The first one that we saw, the first test of spiritual maturity is that maturing faith endures troubles. Nothing stops. Now, some things impede, some things cause us to stumble, some things are, are grievous in our lives, but nothing stops maturing faith. We go through those troubles. And as we looked at that, we saw the truth about pain and problems. We saw our whole new perspective we're to have on life. We saw that, that God has said that what we are on the inside, the richness that's on the inside counts. But this morning, we're looking at a maturing walk of faith that deals with temptation. In verse 12, it starts this section, and you can see in your Bible down through verse 18, Basically, the theme of these verses is a maturing walk of faith will deal in a godly way with temptations. And the first temptation, and probably the strongest temptation that we have in life, is to not finish the race. You know, there's so many obstacles, so many detours, there's so many impediments, there's so many seeming stone walls that we face in the Christian life because the Bible calls the Christian life a struggle, a race, a warfare. We are to be soldiers. We are to be athletes that discipline ourselves. We are to be those who endure to the end. And you know what the evidence is of salvation? The ancient theologians used to call it the persevering of the saints. The Lord says those that endure to the end will be saved. Those who are truly saved endure to the end. They do not turn away. They don't turn back. They don't pull back. They never stop loving and serving and following Christ. Well, John Monsell, uh, an old hymn writer, focused on this virtue of winning the crown. He says, fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength, Christ thy right. Lay hold on life and it shall be thy joy and crown eternally. Run the straight race through God's good grace. Lift up thine eyes. Seek his face. Life with its way before thee lies. Christ is the path. Christ the prize. Cast care aside. Lean on thy guide. His boundless mercy will provide. Trust, and thy trusting soul shall prove. Christ is its life, and Christ its love. 
You know, the Apostle John, as he's writing in Revelation, the end of the scriptures, as he's writing to the churches, he mentions this crown of life that James introduces in the first book of the New Testament. It's interesting that the crown of life is in the first book chronologically written of the New Testament, the epistle of James, and it's in the last book, the Revelation. And in both of them it says endure, and John says this, Blessed is he that endures to the end. Because if he does, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those that love him. You see, the scriptures say that Christ's love is so strong that it can hold us. In fact, this is what Christ's brother Jude said, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. It is God holding us that helps us to persevere, that helps us to never stop loving him to the end. The question is, have you entered into his love? Have you become a lover, a follower, a seeker, a knower of Jesus Christ? On September 25th, 1968, something happened. Now, I know half of you weren't even alive then. About half our congregation is 30 and under, and about half is over 30. Well, on September 25th, 1968, all of America's eyes, collectively, our consciousness, was, was almost staggered by the events. Early in the year, the North Koreans captured one of our military boats. They captured a military boat and took everybody hostage. It's called the Pueblo. You can read about it in history. Right after that, Martin Luther King was gunned down. Right after that, there were massive riots in Chicago. And then the favored son, Robert F. Kennedy, was similarly gunned down in assassination. That was a bad year, 1968, for America. But in the midst of all that, The world's attention was focused on many things. America's attention was focused on many things. Two men were walking through the jungles of Erie and Jaya, which most people still don't even know where that is. Their names were Stanley Dale, Phil Masters. They had already gone into that tribal region where the savage, head-hunting, cannibal, vicious, bloodthirsty cannibal savages lived. They had already gone in sharing the gospel and had gotten shot full of arrows. They pulled the arrows out, scampered back home, and spent agonizing months recovering from the punctured wounds of their organs. Then, after those months of recovery, they walked over a 10,000-foot pass into this Stone Age valley of primitive people and went back with the gospel of Christ again to the Yali people. I'd like to read to you what happened that day because I think it captures the essence of of what it means to win the crown of life. Because what happened to them was 50 years of enduring for Christ was compressed into about 45 to 50 seconds as they endured the ultimate test. They were faithful to the death. Listen as one of those who witnessed their death writes these words. On the day, September 25, 1968, two Men were brutally and savagely murdered. Their bodies, riddled with arrows, fell on a remote riverbank in the dense jungles of Irinjaya. They were the victims of Christless cannibal savages. Their last moments were witnessed by hundreds of warriors who shot their arrows, but two who later were converted and came to Christ retold the story I'm about to share with you now. One, Nalimo was his name, helped to kill them. He went out and put his hands on Stanley Dale's shoulders and smiled at him and turned him so his back would be toward the men shooting the arrows. And while he smiled and looked into his eyes, the warriors came out of the jungle and pulled their arrows. The other, Yemu, was a friend and helper and guide who tried to prevent their murder. Our story picks up on their second visit, these two regions beyond Missionary Union Missionaries, that was the name of their board, have to these remote tribesmen. On their first visit, they were severely shot with arrows. They had several agonizing months of slow recovery. But undaunted, they returned and tried to reach the tribe. When the tribe refused to listen for the second time, they turned and picked up their packs and began to head home to their families. One and a half hours from their last campsite, Phil and Stan passed beyond the last signs of human habitation in the northern Seng. Looking up toward the west, Stan caught a sight of the 10,000-foot pass. It was just 3,000 feet above them. 
From the top of that pass, we'll almost be able to see the airstrip at Nina, Stan told the, the Dannies who carried their, their gear to encourage them. Everyone quickened their pace, although the terrain was very tough. The large force of Yali, the cannibals were chasing him, was uh, out of sight, and Yemu thought perhaps they'd given up. Perhaps they've all gone home. But in the next moment, a great war cry resounded somewhere in the forest behind them, and Yemu's heart sank. This is it, he thought. Hurry, my father, Yemu pleaded. I fear they will kill you this time. No, Yemu, I'll stay behind. You go on ahead. You help Phil make it over the pass, Stan replied calmly. He knows, Yemu thought. He heard that shout, and he knows that this time they really mean to kill. But Yemu stayed with Stan. The three Dannys went ahead with Phil, and beyond them, the Yendal River grew shallow, and it, flew, it began flowing over a wide and stony bed. They waded through it for 300 yards and reached the gravel beach. Beyond the beach, the trail left the river and climbed directly to the pass, only 2,000 feet of climbing, and they would be over and on their way to safety. But this time, the war cry resounded, only it was much closer. Suddenly, they came floundering through the river, their bows held high. Others streamed down through the forest, their floppy rattan coils rattling, and Stan and Yemu stood at the lower end of the gravelly beach, facing them. Phil was alone. At the other end, he was 50 yards distant with three Dannys who waited 30 year yards behind him. As they all looked back in horror, they saw Stan as he raised his staff over his head and grimly faced the Wickboon horde. Yemu, he shouted over his shoulder, leave me. Keeping his staff raised, not to strike, but to form a human barrier against the advancing tide of hundreds of warriors. Looking them straight in the eye, he said, all of you, turn around, go home. A priest of Kembu, their animistic, occultic religion, by the name of Barraway, slipped around behind Stan and drawing his bow at point-blank range, shot an arrow under his upraised right arm. Another priest, Bunu, shot a bamboo-bladed shaft directly into Stan's back, just below his right shoulder. Yemu was crying now. He was shouting to them, Stop! The arrows began to enter his flesh, so he ran. As Stan stood there, arrows piercing him, he pulled them out one by one, broke them in half, and cast them away. Dozens of them were coming at him from all directions. He kept pulling them out. He kept breaking them. He kept dropping them at his feet until he could not keep ahead of them. Nalimo reached the scene after 30 arrows had found their mark in Stan's body. How can he stand there so long, Nalimo gasped. Why doesn't he fall? And one of us, why we would have fallen long ago. And then a different kind of shaft pierced Nalimo's own heart. Fear. Perhaps... He's immortal. Nalimo's normally impassive face melted with a sudden emotion. Because of that emotion, Nalimo later said he did not shoot an arrow into Stan's body. Stan faced his enemies, steady and unwavering except for the jolt as each new strike entered his body. Yemu ran to where Phil stood alone. Together they watched in anguish at Stan's agony. Fifty or more warriors now detached from the main force and came toward them. Phil pushed Yemu behind him. <clears throat> He speechlessly told him with his arms, run. Phil seemed hardly to notice the warriors encircling him. His eyes were fixed on Stan, 50 arrows, 60. Red ribbons of blood now trailed from the many wounds, but still Stan stood his ground. Nalimo saw he was not alone in his fear. The attack that had begun with hilarity, now the warriors shot their arrows in desperation, bordering on panic because Stan wouldn't fall. Perhaps Kusaho was right. Perhaps they were committing a monstrous crime against the supernatural world instead of defending their tribal religion as they intended. Fall, they screamed at Stan. Die. It was almost a plea. Please die. Yemu did not hear Phil say anything as the warriors encircled him and began shooting their arrows at him. Phil made no attempt to flee or even to struggle. He had faced many dangers many times, but never certain death. But Stan had shown him how to face it. If he needed an example, the example could hardly have been followed with greater courage. 
Once again, it was Barraway, the witch doctor, who shot the first arrow, and it took almost as many arrows to down Phil as it had Stan. Yemu and the three Dannies waited until they knew that Phil was also too badly wounded to survive, and then they ran. Not very many people ever met Phil Masters or Stanley Dale, but on that little gravel bank of a river in a remote jungle of an island in the Pacific, the Lord Jesus Christ was there to usher them into his presence. Look back at our text in James chapter 1. Blessed is one who perseveres under trial. That is one form of trial. But when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now turn to Revelation 2.10 to see the last time this crown of life is mentioned. In Revelation 2.10, over 50 years later, the Apostle John records Jesus as saying, Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer as he was writing to the Smyrnans who were going to suffer deeply for their faith in Christ. This is what Revelation 2.10 says, I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecutions for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death. And I, Jesus said, I will give you a crown of life. I wonder, are we faithful? Do we love him so much that we'll be faithful to death if it's 50 years from now, if the Lord tarries, or if it's on the way home today, or if in three or six or nine months we're in a situation where someone is warning us if we don't stop talking about Christ, that they will kill us for our testimony of Christ. Have you decided in your heart you'll be faithful? Have you decided in your heart you're going to finish the race? Have you decided you're going to go to the end? And you're going to follow Jesus Christ, loving him all the way. Number one, that's an evidence of salvation. Number two, that is what gains the great reward of the crown of life. The Bible talks about five different crowns. The scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 15 that in glory we will all shine with varying degrees of splendor. I don't know if you realize that. Some people are going to really shine. And some people are going to kind of shine. And that's why God's going to have to wipe away the tears. Because if we could see from God's perspective on what we're doing in our life now, we would often alter our priorities. Because a lot of us spend a lot of time with a lot of things that are going to burn up into nothing but ash. They're not going to eternally endure 1 Corinthians 15.40 says God's going to reward us differently. We'll all be happy servants, it says in Matthew 20, of the one Lord. But the scriptures tell us that those who are faithful will receive rewards. Let me just sketch for you what they are. And if you've never written these down, maybe you should. But turn to 1 Corinthians 9.25. I want to show you uh, the elements. And, and we aren't sure in the scriptures whether these are actually five different crowns or five flavors of the same crown, uh, whether people are going to have multiple crowns or whether they're going to have different uh, orders. It doesn't, I mean, how God dispenses this doesn't matter. All we know is that God looks at us through five special ways of examining our lives. And he's going to measure us in those ways as he looks through these measuring instruments. The first one is a steadfast racer in 1 Corinthians 9.25. And this is the person, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. We do it for an imperishable. Therefore, Paul says, here's my testimony. I run in such a way as to not be without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I beat my body. I make it my slave. Listen. Lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. You say disqualified? Paul, he wrote half the New Testament. We're, his, we're heirs to his message in the Western church. We are the ones that, because of him sharing the gospel, we know Christ. His books have sold more than anybody else's books. I mean, he is phenomenal. He would be disqualified? Well, listen. As one person commenting on this wrote this, if the athlete would break his training, he was disqualified. If he broke the rules of the game, he was disqualified. 
The issue is not what he thinks or what the spectators think, but what the judges say. One day, each of us Christians will stand before Christ on his judgment seat. And the Greek word judgment seat is bema. It's the same word used to describe the disciplined lives of those who obey the rules and get the prizes. And we will receive a prize if we do not fail at the end. There are those in the scriptures who did. Lot failed in the end. Samson failed. Saul failed. Ananias and Sapphira. And it can happen to us. Well, what did the scriptures say? Does the failure mean a losing of salvation? Well, the scriptures tell us not that we will lose our salvation, but that the scriptures say we can become least in the kingdom of heaven. Some Christians will receive their rank because of their ill treatment of the scriptures. And some will not receive rewards because they went out of the racetrack. It doesn't mean losing salvation. It means losing the eternal reward of having obeyed and pleased and kept the rules in this life. The Lord Jesus Christ warned often of this. He says that those in Matthew 20 who don't obey his word will be called least in the kingdom of God. Many commentators say that that, that means called at least means what other people say about us, but that's not what God says. Our reputation among other people, including other Christians, may not be adversely affected if we don't obey. But God always knows, God always cares. It's not what we are called by others, but what God calls us that is of ultimate importance. And it should be the concern of every believer who loves the Lord that he never have cause for God to say that we're the least. You know, we work so hard to be accepted in this life. We work so hard to finish things in this life. We work so hard to get security and status and to have the things, especially for our loved ones and for our families. We work so hard for that, and yet the whole time we're working on that, there's a higher one, the Lord of all, Jesus, who says, where do I fit in that plan? Is what you're doing bringing glory eternally to me? Or is it just filling your earthly time with temporary joys? He says this, watch yourselves. Don't lose what you have accomplished. Make sure you receive a full reward. To disdain even the smallest part of God's word is to demonstrate a disdain for all of it. Because its parts are inseparable. And James says later in his epistle, whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one point is guilty of all. To ignore or reject the least of God's word is to cheapen all of it and leads to us becoming the least in his kingdom. Such Christians receive their rank because they ill-treat God's word. Well, Paul says, that's not going to be me. 1 Corinthians 9.27, he says, I am going to master my old nature. I'm going to steadfastly race. I'm going to stay in the track. Secondly, if you want to turn to Philippians... 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul talks also about the unselfish worker. The steadfast racer is in 1 Corinthians 9. They stay in their, their lane. They, they discipline themselves. They stay in the race to the end. The unselfish worker faithfully wins souls, and he'll get the crown of honor. The unfading crown goes to the one who stays in the race, but the, the crown of honor goes to the one who along the way wins souls. And it says in Philippians 4, in verse 1, these words, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy, my crown. It's the same crown that 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says is the crown of rejoicing when we have others we bring with us into the presence of the Lord because we have invested our life in them, because we have been a part of sowing the seed of watering and of seeing God harvest. We have been making disciples all along the way as we have pleased God. But for those who are the unselfish workers, because they faithfully proclaim the truth, there's a crown of exaltation. For those who have true saving faith and are faithful to live in hope till Jesus comes, bringing those with them, there's a crown of rejoicing, but there's another crown. Keep turning to the right to 2 Timothy. It goes Philippians, Colossians, the Thessalonian epistles, 1 Timothy, and 2 Timothy has the third crown. 
And it says that if you are faithful until Christ comes, you'll be a victorious warrior. Look what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. He says, In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not just to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Do you see how these all seem to kind of, they start blending together, because it's loving the Lord, it's looking for the Lord, it's, it's denying ourselves to see him. But he says there, For all those who faithfully watch for Christ, they will get the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness is God's reward for the faithful and righteous life. It's the incentive for faithfulness. It's our desire for holiness. It's the promise of the Lord's appearing. And because Paul loved Christ's appearing, because he looked for it, because he lived righteously, because he served faithfully, the Lord says, you're a victorious warrior. You've never deserted the army. You've kept in line with my direction. You've always looked to me, the commanding officer, and because you love me to the end, I will give you, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, the crown of righteousness. If we love Christ's appearing, if we live in obedience to his will, if we do the work he's called us to do, he says you'll be crowned. Well, the steadfast racer, the unselfish worker, the victorious warrior, there's another one, keep turning to the right, past Titus and Philemon and Hebrews and James and go to 1 Peter chapter 5 because there's also the faithful example crown we can be in the lanes as a faithful racer and steadfast we can be an unselfish sharer of the gospel we can be a victorious worker but Christ also rewards those who are faithful examples those are the faithful shepherds who get the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5 look at verses 3 and 4 nor is yet lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. As Paul said, follow Christ like I'm following him. And look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you faithful shepherds, you faithful examples to the flock, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. If you think about it, when you're packing to go somewhere, you're very careful what you take if you're going to live out of a suitcase. I've traveled a lot in my life, and there's nothing worse than opening up your suitcase and finding the wrong stuff at the other end of the line. Now, I've found my bags have been sent to hither and yon, and I've had them rained on and soaked and stained and everything else. But there's nothing worse than coming into an appointment or coming into an, uh, a time that you have to be for an extended time and to not be dressed properly. You feel awful. You feel like you want to hide because you're not ready to come in. You don't have the proper equipment. You don't have the proper clothing to present yourself. All of us are on a journey right now. It's a short journey. 70, 80 years, 90 years. Compared to eternity, it's nothing. And we get to pack our clothes. That, that's really about all we're supposed to do here. Pack our clothes for eternity. And God says the only thing that you can back in your bag that you can wear is right here. Steadfast racer, stay and keep my rules. Unselfish worker, tell people about me. Victorious warrior, look to me as your commander in chief. Faithful example to the flock. He says, and that's what you're going to wear forever. That's what you're going to look like. You're going to be crowned and you are going to be known as I knew you for all eternity. And some, Daniel 12 says, are going to just shine with the brightness, the magnitude of a star forever. And others are not. I wonder, is it worth getting all distracted down here and not packing for where you're going to spend eternity? Now, some people aren't even going to God's presence for eternity. That's more important. That's the first thing. Get clothed with Christ's righteousness. But if you know Christ, are you ready for what you're going to wear forever? You know what it says in Revelation 19? It says that the saints are going to be clothed in fine white garments, which are their righteousnesses. Their righteousnesses that they wear. The righteousness that we were in Christ. How we obeyed Him. How we sought Him. How we longed for Him. How we loved Him. How we served Him is what we're going to wear forever. In college, in the athletic teams, when I used to be an athlete, uh, I used to be a follower of athletics. Definitely wasn't a, an athlete. I was in track and field and football back when the Earth's crust was cooling. You know, it was a long time ago. 
But I remember I had a coach, and he knew this verse, and he used to tell us as we were dressing out, and we're just starting to get dressed before we got all the pads and everything on, you're just basically in your underwear. He says, you know what, some of you, that's all you're going to have for eternity if you don't get in gear for the Lord. He said, wouldn't you be embarrassed to go out on the field in your underwear? I mean, what a, a great coach. I mean, never forget that. I mean, that sticks in your mind. Because who would go out with a stands full, not dressed? You'd be totally embarrassed. But there are a lot of Christians that are coming through the tunnel right now. And they aren't dressed yet. And they're going into eternity. And the Apostle Paul says, one last crown. That's what we're looking at. Back to James 1 and verse 12. And I want to kind of wind up right there where we began. For all who love the Lord, there will be the crown of life, James says in verse 12. And it comes by being a blessed one who perseveres under trials. And being approved, we receive the crown of life which the Lord promised to those who love Him. Do you love the Lord this morning? For Stanley Dale and Phil Masters, their love for the Lord, for 50 years of, of, of avoiding all sin and entanglement and of not loving the world, that 50 years was compressed into just a few moments standing as they were shot to death with arrows. I personally think that there's special grace for martyrdom and it's almost harder to live faithful for 70 years than it is for 70 seconds while someone executes you. Although we all fear that the most, we don't seem to fear the long haul. In fact, a lot of Christians are bailing out because they can't take the long haul. All the metaphors that Paul uses for the Christian life portray a difficult struggle. He calls it an agonizomai. The word pictures that the New Testament uses are word pictures of warfare, of races, of struggles, of building. All of life is a struggle. And we must please Christ. In fact, one German pastor wrote an entire book about the Christian life. He called it the arena of faith. This is how his book is introduced. This is the opening paragraph. Is not the whole New Testament an astonishing, many-sided picture of a race and the completion of our spiritual life? Are we not all in the arena of faith? Are we not all training? Are we not all learning self-control? Are we not all ruthlessly denying ourselves? Do we hear the herald? Do we enter the race course? Oh, there are different kinds of contests. But we're all racing to the goal. We're all boxing. We're all wrestling. We're all keeping the rules. Christ is the umpire. And the danger is always present of being disqualified. We must all appear before the exalted throne of the divine judge on that great day. He distributes the prizes. Out of his hands, the victors will receive their wreath and the palm. The list of victors, the book of life, the triumphal entry into the homeland, our great banquet at the wedding feast of the Lamb, the festival, the gifts, the place of honor. In fact, there is scarcely one essential feature of the whole course of games that has escaped the writers of the New Testament that they have not employed in their figures of speech. Basically, what does the Bible say? What did that German pastor mean? He said there's three things you have to do to win the crown. Number one is you have to finish the race. God says no one gets a crown that doesn't finish. Are you planning now to finish your Christian life? I hear so many people, they say, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to retire. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm going to cut back. You know what God says? Serve to the end. There's no retirement from the Christian life. We can retire from, from what we have to do from day-to-day life to earn our keep and eat, but we never retire from serving the Lord. In fact, the Lord speaks of, of pressing toward the mark. You remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4? He says, I'm pressing toward the mark. How old was he? He was just about two years short of death. And he was looking for new challenges for the Lord. Now, a lot of Christians kind of check out a long time before that, looking for no more challenges. Are you planning to finish the race? He only receives the prize who has carried through the, the full requirements of the contest. Philippians 3.20, your citizenship is in heaven, the Lord says. Wait for the Savior. Philippians 3.14, Paul said, I press toward the goal. I want the prize of the high calling of God. Whoever, after rounding the course seven times in the Greek games, and crossed the starting line with even one step or even one foot across the line ahead of the race would carry off the prize. But no one that didn't finish the race was rewarded. David 
failed once, we remember well, but he finished the race. Moses failed one memorable time at the rock, but he finished the race. Peter failed to stand for Christ and denied him, but he finished the race. Paul failed early on and struggled all his life through, but he finished the race. Are you planning to finish the race? Are you going to cut back to enjoy life and neglect enjoying Christ? Finish the race. Number two, endurance was required. No relief was allowed. In the race, you couldn't stop. You couldn't be running your laps and all of a sudden say, I'm going to go over for a pit stop like in auto racing. No pit stops were allowed in the race. You had to endure to the end. And there's some Christians who kind of pull aside and they quit. God says, no. No quitting. Yes, we should retreat. Yes, we should have times of, we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about quietness and solitude and intimacy with Christ. But you never get out of the race. The last thing the scriptures say, that obedience is required all the way. We cannot shorten the course. We have to press forward. We can't pause. We can't permit ourselves to be detained. We must be careful not to stumble. Christ preserves us. And he says, I'll give you a crown of life if you love Christ to the end. I'll give you a crown of rejoicing if you'll disciple others. I'll give you the unfading crown of self-control if you'll love me more than your own desires. I'll give you the crown of righteousness if you'll finish following me. I'll give you the crown of glory if you'll serve my church. I think we have to look at Revelation 4 because I want to see what good the crowns are. You better turn there. We have just two minutes. Look at Revelation 4 because some of you might be new and you say, Crown? What do I want with a crown? I've never worn a crown here on earth. What do I want one for? Why would I alter my lifestyle to get this crown? What am I going to do with it? Well, it's very important. I guess you should know what you're going to do with it and what I want to do with mine. That's why I want one so badly. Revelation 4, verses 9 through 11. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. And they worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. And they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You have created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Do you catch what we do with the crowns? The four and twenty elders, twenty-four elders, twelve and twelve, speak of the redeemed people of God. Old covenant, new covenant, all saved the same way through Christ. Those looking forward to him, us looking back at his sacrifice. All together meet around the glassy sea. All the redeemed come, and they come to worship and adore the Lamb. And the twenty-four elders representing us fall before him. And then they take their crown, and they cast it at the feet of the king of the universe. Why? Because they say that all we were in life was for you. You are king of my life. I crown thee now. Thine shalt the glory be. Let me ask you this morning, are you saved? You can't have a crown of life if you've never come to know Christ. Number two, are you soul winning? Are you going to get a crown of rejoicing to throw before Christ? Are you spirit controlled? Are you going to get the unfading crown? Are you seeking Jesus all through life to get the crown of righteousness? Are you serving as an example to his church, his sheep, to get the crown of glory? The blood that drenched that gravel and sand along a remote river at Erian Jaya sprang up to the salvation of those headhunters. Stan and Phil will be crowned as good and faithful servants of Christ. Are you planning to finish the race? Are you planning on winning the crown? They all seem to blend together, but the common element is God gives a crown to those who love Christ so much that they have come to him as their only hope of salvation. First step is salvation. First step to heaven, the only step, is coming through Christ. But if you never stop loving him, and if you never stop seeking and looking and Wanting to please Him. And if you'll tell people about Him along the way, and if you'll deny yourself, and if you'll say, I am going to finish the race, and I'm going to keep looking at you, my Commander-in-Chief, you'll not fail to win a crown. So you'll have something to cast before His throne. Let's bow and be dismissed as we let the Lord... Speak to our hearts about what we need to do to win the crown.
Father, I pray this morning, first of all, for just one who might be here this morning who has never come in simple faith to receive salvation. And Father, right here this morning in this service, by the simple act of opening their heart and saying, Lord Jesus, I know that you died in my place. I've heard the gospel, but I've never embraced you as my only hope of salvation. That you died in my place. You gave yourself for me. Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. You said that even a bruised reed, a smoking flax, you'll never quench. Even the smallest, imperceptible to all, but seen by you, act of faith in turning to Christ is acceptable to you. Because you gave yourself for us. I pray for any who have never trusted Christ that they will respond to the tugging of your spirit this morning. Father, for the many who know you here this morning, I pray that there would be a concerted decision here this morning that each one of your saints, your born again, genuinely born again, children will say, I am going to win the crown. I'm not going to be disqualified. I'm going to finish the race. I'm going to love you to the end. Father, if never before that decision's been made, I pray that this morning would be a morning that will be unforgettable. When they get in gear and get on the track and get running and never look back never turn back and finish the race for you. We'll thank you for what you do in our lives as we faithfully seek to win the crown so that we can have something to cast at your feet. We love you. We thank you. We pray that you will be working our hearts this day. For Jesus' sake, amen.